This week in the Enterprise Security News, why you need Recorded Future's Ultimate Security Intelligence Kit, securing the multi-cloud environment through CSPM and SSPM, CyberKnight joins forces with Armus to bring agentless EDR to OT, IoT, and ICS environments, Already a lot of acronyms. Ativo Network's enhanced EDN solution provides attackers from seeing or exploiting production data. Checkpoint uh, Infinity Sock is launched and more. In our second segment, we welcome Scott DeLong, Chief Information Officer and Senior Technology and Security Officer at Scott DeLong & Associates to talk about living through a ransomware attack. In the final segment, we welcome Rob Reck. He's the Chief Information Security Officer at Ping Identity to discuss trends in enterprise identity. Stay tuned for all that and more for this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Detecting and responding to threats in the cloud is harder than doing it on-prem. Even when you do have the visibility you need, legacy security workflows weren't designed for the speed and complexity of cloud environments. Cloud-native security solutions from ExtraHop are purpose-built to spot threats across the hybrid attack surface, provide detailed investigation steps, and help you automate response. Request your 30-day free trial at securityweekly.com forward slash ExtraHop. Welcome to episode 190 of Enterprise Security Weekly, or ESW, because we have acronyms too. Uh, it's July 8th, 2020. It's hot here in Rhode Island, and I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. And speaking of hot, I got Mr. John Strand on the lines remotely. Welcome, John. Hey, it's finally summer here, and I can say it's actually hot. <laughs> and more hotness, Mr. Matt Alderman from Colorado. Welcome, Matt. Yes, we're at 7,500 feet in elevation, and the sun is hot, and I got two more Coloradans coming on today. So this is the there Colorado you go. Show. It's the Colorado Show today. Very nice. Uh, quick announcement. Join the Security Weekly mailing list for webcasts, virtual training announcements, and receive your personal invite to our Discord server. You can go to securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. Click the button to join the list. Also, with all the recent changes to Black Hat and DEF CON, we're going to keep doing what we do best. That's host virtual podcasts. Proud to announce the Hacker Summer Camp 2020, a Security Weekly virtual live event streaming August 3rd through August 6th. To reserve your slot now for a micro interview if you work for a product vendor and would like to come on the show and talk about why your product is better than anyone else's, you can go to securityweekly.com forward slash summer camp 2020. And now... We're going to talk about enterprise security news. Yay. What do you, where do you guys want to go first? Oh, so many stories, so little time. <laughs> yes. Or in fact, 11. Well, and then I added two more. There's a couple oh, gotcha. uh, that came across my radar. So there's actually 13. Um, a couple of the easy Jeez. ones. Like, I, I thought the IBM um, story I, I added was they amend their credit arrangement to secure another two and a half billion dollars in in funding. I mean, if, you, if we think about that for a second, I mean, here's one of the. I mean, IBM's gigantic, right? And and they're out securing debt funding, which means they probably need some cash to survive. Kind of kind of what's going on right now. And, and it's and, not a small of, amount of cash either. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> It, if you read the article a little deeper, not only did they secure a new two and a half billion, they also got the option to extend their ten and a half billion another two years on its maturity date. So Oof. they're really hoarding some cash to make sure they can get through this. I thought I guess it, just, it was very interesting. What, is it just COVID? Because what know. I don't what I because what I don't understand about this. Is like you said, IBM is a monster, right? 
And I've been talking to a number of people in the tech services industry, and there's been some companies, of course, that have had issues. But honestly, with the way the world is going, brick and mortar is shut down in a lot of places. It seems like e-commerce, it seems like VPNs, it seems mm. like a lot of tech has exploded to basically handle this change in the economy. So it's interesting to me. So what are they doing with this cash? How are they restructuring? How are they trying to stay competitive? Because that's so much money. Yeah, I mean, they did make an announcement uh, today, right before the show. I didn't get a chance to look at the full article uh, around uh, some robotic um, automation, uh, RPA. So I think they're using some of this money to make some investments, probably to add some additional capabilities. You know, they bought Red Hat last year for a pretty penny, you know, so, you know, part of that debt could be, you know, to pay for some of these mergers and acquisitions to try to expand capabilities too. Yeah. Fund their cloud uh, projects as well, most likely. Um, Recorded Future made an announcement, the ultimate security intelligence kit. Ugh. Did you look at what's in it? I did. I have it right yeah, here. I did it's, too. it's one, two, three, four eBooks, three reports, two white papers, four podcasts. Demo. Three webinars and two videos. Hmm. Interesting. So, uh, uh, so there's some things in here. Like I've seen some of these that are really, really good. Um, but there's a lot of this that is still the standard IP URL hash type threat intelligence. Right. Um, and, and that really frustrates me. The other thing is a number of these are focusing on understand what threats would come after your organization and protect against those threats. That's garbage. I cannot say this enough. If you're looking at threat intelligence to say, well, we're in retail, this is attack that hit retail, this is all we have to watch out for, you're missing the point. Attackers will adapt their tools, techniques, and tactics on a per customer basis when necessary. So there's some good stuff in here. There really, really is. But anything that's just talking about URLs and domains and IP addresses and hashes, that's garbage for a targeted attack against an organization. Um, and all the other stuff, like if you're talking about non targeted attacks, your traditional firewalls, IPS, IDS, spam filters should be catching that anyway. So it looks like a lot of stuff. And as I said, some of it's good, but some of it is just really missing the mark on what threat intelligence should actually be. Yeah. And in, it comes down to uh, analyzing the data, right? And how yep. you're analyzing the data and what data you're analyzing and how applicable that is to you. So there's the you know, uh, kind of industry vertical specific stuff, right? Which has some limited use cases, right? But then there's the, mm -hmm. like, what's the most popular malware out there and what techniques are they using? And am I able to uh, detect and defend myself against those particular attacks? That could be useful, right? You know, then there's mm -hmm. the, just knowing about all the tactics and uh, techniques that are out there and you know, will those come at me? I don't well, know. Then there's understanding well, who your attacker is, which is different from what techniques they're using. And to me, that has a limited purpose as well, right? It, you're absolutely right. And where the collision is going to happen, and it has to happen, and it has to happen now, is threat intelligence and threat and adversarial emulation are going to collide with each other. Mm -hmm. Where you're going to have tools, you're going to have things like Scythe and XM Cyber and all these different vendors where you're taking that threat intelligence, you're putting it into a platform that can actually replicate those different techniques, and then you can see how your organization reacts to those attacks. Mm -hmm. That's vulnerability assessments moving forward over the next years. So I'm still waiting for this convergence to actually happen where you have vulnerability assessments converting with uh, emulation with threat intelligence, then we're actually getting somewhere. Because then we're just not collecting IP addresses and, ha and right. hashes. We're basically emulating the tactics live in an environment and seeing how your organization responds. So if you're looking for a way to actually make a lot of money, congratulations, go do that. Take threat intelligence, do emulation or simulation where you're actually making that happen in an organization, correlate it back to something like MITRE, create gap analysis for your customers, mm -hmm. you're going to be in a great place. I agree. I agree. And then if you can tie that to SOAR so you can do some automated remediation or some actions around it. Oh, you, whoa, whoa. let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still think it, you know, it, it definitely has uh, a human element, right, to analyze all of this, right? Even if you have the capability mm -hmm. to take some of the TDPs and uh, simulate them in your environment, you're still going to know which ones are 
likely to cause the most damage. Like, there's just a bunch of stuff in there that uh, I, you need a threat intel analyst, right? Uh, or that yeah. function on your team. You can't replace it all with AI and software. <laughs> yep. And that's why you're seeing some of these MSSP announcements as well. Yeah. You know, there's a couple of them in here where you're seeing the managed service providers adding threat, more threat capabilities, more SOAR capabilities, uh, overlap into IoT and OCS. I mean, Armis has two partnerships in the in the announcement this week to add some of the OT ICS capabilities into one's a managed service provider and the other one's a, a, a technology vendor. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and th those TTBs obviously are specific to that uh, specific vertical, right? So, anyway, uh, where do you want to go next? Um, I thought the the future of zero trust continuous authentication was a yes. little interesting, right? In in that we realize that the new perimeter is the user and the application, right? It's a combination of those. Some would say it's the user, some would say it's the app. I think it's the interaction of the user and the app a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so this mm -hmm. concept of continuous authentication, right? And needing to continually authenticate uh, users to applications is an interesting concept because we can't just rely on that single authentication into the network anymore if that network is kind of outside of your realm. So I, I thought it was a very interesting approach I, in the article. So I, I thought that the article was a little bit misleading because it made it sound like you authenticate once and you're done. And that's not quite the way most services work. Um, if you're looking at, just to use Kerberos, for example, you're granted a ticket, granting ticket, and then you can use that ticket and you can move around and you're constantly being authenticated based on that token that you're showing your services. So you're constantly re-authenticated again and again and again and again. But that aside, like getting into semantics and trying to split it, if somebody was reading this, they'd be like, well, why aren't we continuously authenticating? When, when in fact, that's what most technologies do. What was interesting and, and where I agree 110% was the kind of the user behavioral and entity analytics side of it, where it's not just an issue of that continuous authentication, but actually seeing what the API is doing seeing what the user is doing, and then making a determination as to whether or not this is normal, abnormal, or outright malicious behavior. And with that, I agree 110% with this article because that's where all of our security has to go. And let's also be honest, Signal Science's bread and butter has been looking at web applications and protecting web applications using that type of technique since their inception. I mean, Paul, you remember they came on years ago mm. where a lot of web application firewalls were really falling down flat on their face. And Signal Science has had some really great approaches to actually detecting the attacks. And I really think that that's what kind of, kind of threw them in the forefront of being able to detect those types of attacks. So they're basically using their core model of what they've been doing for years. And they're now, I don't think they're now applying. They've been applying it for APIs and web servers for a long time. And the overall point is Signal Sciences is doing it right. Watch what's actually being requested in the API. Watch what's being requested of the application. And then set up different thresholds of what a normal human would do versus an automated scan versus somebody trying to exfiltrate data. I love this approach. Yeah, it, it's very similar to our conversation about threat intelligence, right? It's not just IPs and hashes and domains, right? Mm -hmm. It's actually actionable intelligence uh, and yeah. derived from intelligent sources and correlation, right? Uh, it's yeah. the same thing you need in, inside your web app. And I also think that, you know, application development gets a lot harder now because we have to write such defensible code. Like, you can't trust anything inside your application today. And I think that's been a slow change over time. You know, we had those monolithic applications. We made a lot of assumptions about what we should trust and what we shouldn't. And it was like, if we were wrong, it's the user's fault, right? Yep. Now, when you read an article like this, if you think about it from a developer perspective, we're like, I got to write some really defensible code, right? Like, I can't trust anything. I have to constantly authenticate, re-authenticate, observe behavior, or check a system to see what the observed behaviors are and then make a decision based on that. Um, it, and it just, you know, I think it ups the game uh, for software developers yeah. to think about it this way. Well, but I, I think it had to, but... You know, you talk about how complicated it is now, and I know that all the C developers look at that and they're like, well, things aren't that hard. Yeah, they are. Yes. Uh, whenever you have APIs that are interacting with each other, you have microservices, you have Docker containers. Um, it is actually a really, really hard problem. 
And Paul, do you still feel like things are accelerating? Like you're, you've done way more development in this space than I have. Do you still feel like every single week there's new APIs, there's new coding languages, there's new things that are being done, things are changing. Do you still see that rapid advancement in the code base and the difficulty in keeping up? Yeah, absolutely. Especially when you look at the cloud native stuff. Um, where mm -hmm. I, I mean, basically, I'm just taking my code, sometimes not even my code, my configuration, and I'm putting it in the cloud. That stuff is just yeah. changing. So not even just changing, but it's not well proven enough to have some defined paths of this is how you do it, right? And then it changes yeah. across cloud providers. That's where I see the most complexity and most opportunity to have some serious vulnerabilities in your infrastructure and apps. Yeah, for sure. Um, we talked about Exabeam, securing the multi, oh, speaking of multi-cloud, through CSPM and SSPM. This is from Cypher Cloud. What is, what is this what acronym? Is this? Alphabet I was hoping soups. you knew. Yeah. Well, it's, it's it's so here's what I believe Cypher Cloud is is a CASB, right? And what mm. they're doing is using a CASB approach to secure both SaaS and IaaS um, cloud aspects, right? You guys know I'm not a big fan of CASB approaches. I think it's really difficult these days to take a bunch of remote workers and shove them through a little CASB pipe to monitor activity. You know, w w mm. I think something more native like an app Omni or something like that is a much better approach to securing your SaaS platforms. And there's other CSPMs that integrate natively into the different IaaS providers versus trying to go down this CASB route personally. But, you know... We'll, we'll see if it yeah. works. Oh, so cloud security posture management and SaaS security posture management. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's fancy. Some fancy, fancy terms That's there. That's bad. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you're running a bunch of SaaS platforms, you want to look for some native capabilities. Like I said, you're going to look at an app Omni. If you're looking at the different cloud providers, you know, this is where Redlock and, mm -hmm. and uh, Cloud Needy and, you know, there's a bunch of, products out there that do nat native integrations into these cloud providers to give you that posture management stuff. Why do I want a CASB to do this? Anyways, yeah. just my rant. I agree. Um, what else? Uh, Checkpoint uh, is launching a SOC. Checkpoint Infinity launching a yeah, SOC. So you want to talk about proving something. I mean, this, this it, am I the only one confused? When did Checkpoint on, deal with sock and incident response and i mean is this just another catch-up capability to what palo alto is doing i don't it just seemed out of like left field to me uh unrivaled accuracy to quickly shut down real attacks i mean it sounds like something i want yeah. but you know again yeah, the, but what what is it yeah and uh, what is it and uh, how again with the mssp model how do they know so much about my network and how i do business you know you get that whole mssp mm -hmm. kind of issue and i'm not saying they're all bad necessarily right and they could have a place in many organizations but uh you know knowing where their strengths are and where your own strengths are and balancing the two i think is really where uh you yeah. get the value out of it right uh, you know zero friction deployment and all these fancy terms doesn't necessarily mean that i'm in better shape because i've got you know an msp doing some aspect of my security program yep yeah I mean, come on, checkpoints, of, you know, they're a perimeter play. So, you know, how much of the SOC capability is leveraging their technology, but where are the blind spots, right? I just, I wouldn't expect this announcement from Checkpoint. It, so it just kind of threw me off. A TiVo Network's announcement is uh, curious how they're doing this. Uh, preventing attackers from seeing or exploiting production data. So they're improving file protection right. against human-operated ransomware by concealing and denying access to production map shares, cloud storage, and selected files or folders. I wonder how. Uh, so here's, here's okay. So this one I actually read, this actually came up before the, before the show, came up in another conversation. Um, here's a thought, and I, and I could be wrong. This would be something I'd love to see them actually come on and talk about it. And I could be way off base, but whenever you're mounting a share on a Windows computer system to another computer system, that is done with process ID four, the system process on Windows. It doesn't have a user, it doesn't have a command prompt, it's done by the system account. So mm -hmm. anytime you mount a share, you're asking the system to do it upon your on your behalf and then for you, okay? 
I, I could be wrong, but I think that that has a certain network profile to it. Whereas if you're using something like another application to actually map that share and it's not going through the standard APIs, mm -hmm. that would appear different. And I'm wondering if a TiVo sees that request and is actually obfuscating it and giving them something different or detecting that. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong. The folks at Ativo are wicked smart. And Paul, you know how much I love cyber deception oh, yeah. companies like Ativo. So I, I'm, I'm not going to be like, well, this is garbage. I, this sounds cool. Tell me more. Yeah. And doesn't the process have to interact with LSAS in certain circumstances to get credentials? It does, but that's all going to be handled on the endpoint itself. Mm. Um, so it's going to be handling all that authentication. Yes, it is going to go through the local security authority subsystem service, but the system is what is actually going to be making right. that share call over. So I don't know what they're doing, but this is neat. Mm. That is, that is, I mean, for ransomware especially, I mean, I think that's the right uh, attack vector to uh, message on with this feature, certainly. Yep. Now, they said this EDN, their endpoint detection net, do they have an agent now? It, that's what it sounded like agent? to me. Yeah, that's what it sounded like to me, John. Okay, because that's so. a tough play. Yeah. I, I think that that's cool, but I, I'm telling you right now on IONS uh, calls, I have probably one call every two weeks where people are in agent fatigue, where they're yep. tired of all the Still. agents that they have. Wait, so the we're idea back to that again? Yet another agent. Yeah. I mean, we went through this cycle, right? I mean, late, early 2010s, right? Everybody was tired of agents, and then everybody wanted to replace agents. And then we saw that uptick in, in you know, like 2015 and to up to 17, 18, people were adding agents again. So we're just going back through a cycle we saw about 10 years ago. Yeah, and your modern computer system is like 100 times more powerful than what we had in 2000, and it seems to run slower. So <laughs> there's a problem here. The uh, There's an announcement from Vulcan Cyber now offering customizable vulnerability prioritization for efficient vulnerability oh remediation. God. Now, I, I think what it underscores, because we see a lot of companies uh, entering this space, uh, some have been on this show, and it, it is like one of the top problems in enterprise security today, and that is finding all my vulnerabilities, prioritizing them and remediating like that whole, we're still back to basically the vulnerability management process and patch management process is oh God. challenging. And the reason it's challenging is how do you prioritize and what, what, what so, do we do? So this is so exhausting because we've been talking about it for a long time. Mm -hmm. No, a vendor is not going to be able to come in and set up the prioritization for you. Just stop. Uh, just please, there's better ways to handle, okay, almost every organization that I go into that has trouble with vulnerability prioritization, and I've said this a hundred times, they're sorting their vulnerability output by IP address. So they're basically looking and they're saying, well, this system has 25, this has 50, this has 60, this has zero vulnerabilities. And then they break the workload up based on IP address and geographic location. And it's overwhelming to try to do vulnerability assessments like that. Export your vulnerabilities by plugin ID or by vulnerability ID. And then you can take all those vulnerabilities. Let's say you ha you're, you have, you're missing an Apache patch, right? You can get a list of all the systems that are missing that patch and then you can actually make those changes across your entire environment using things like Ansible, Puppet, Chef, mm. SCCM, uh, group policy. So you're not looking at the number of vulnerabilities. You're looking at the classes of vulnerabilities. For the love of God, this isn't hard. Do it. Now, for vendors that are trying to constantly get into this vulnerability management space, they're trying to solve it incorrectly. Number one. Number two, they're not helping their customers. And number three, go innovate somewhere else. This isn't what vulnerability management needs to be moving forward into the future. And I know I've had some people call me out on this in the past. That's great. Yes, I have scanned a million live IP addresses with Black Hills Information Security. And if you sort them correctly, you can go through every vulnerability, highs, mediums, lows, criticals, and informationals, and you can do it in less than two weeks. So there's a right way to do this, folks. Don't 
fall into the trap of trying to sort by IP address. And if you're a vulnerability management vendor, go try to innovate someplace else. I've talked about it many times on the show. Get into threat emulation. Because if you look at the MITRE attack technique matrix for vulnerability management vendors, there's two or three squares in the entire MITRE attack technique matrix that are addressed by vulnerability management the way it's done today. You can do better. Go do better. Sorry. No, Randy. but in, in that's what concerns me is, you know, many of the techniques. I mean, John, you run a pen test company, right? It's not based on the vulnerability, right? <laughs> a lot of times it's misconfiguration mm -hmm. or just exploiting basically the way the systems are stood up. Um, and, and that needs to be included in vulnerability management. And there's some vendors that are, are, you know, definitely leaning in that direction. And attack simulation is definitely one way uh, mm -hmm. to uncover those. But I like your strategy of, uh, you know, it's basically the data technique that we talked about when we were at Tenable too. Is you know, group things by the remediation that can take out the tens of thousands of vulnerabilities, right? Um, and some mm -hmm. of the vendors started to integrate uh, this into their products, but you know, take well, take Tomcat as an dude, example. You're if you're Tomcat four, right, you're you're gonna have like a thousand plus vulnerabilities. But if and you're going to get confused as to, well, what version do I need to go to? Which one remediates this? It's like, well, what if I just model it if I were to go to Tomcat 8, right? That just mm -hmm. took out 10,000 vulnerabilities. And now, like you said, I use my automation tools. I use my DevOps. I get everything up well, to 8, right? And that I don't have to worry about. Right, yes, and sorting it but is... But if you sort it right, you can see that trend, right? Mm -hmm. If you're looking at every single individual system and you have different systems administrators looking at those systems, you're not going to be able to see that trend. But Paul, you remember years ago, whenever we showed Renault, there was that custom uh, report that, mm. that came out for Nessus, mm -hmm. where it would do exactly what we talked about. And when we were doing pen tests together, that was revolutionary for you and me. Right. And that report plugin just changed the entire game for us, and it made us a lot more effective at what we were doing. And I remember sitting down and we were talking to Renault about it. God, what was that? Like 2009, 2010? Probably. And it very quickly got added into Nessus. I still don't think Rapid7 does it. Uh, if you look at a lot of the vulnerability management platforms that are out there, they don't give you that ability. They're still doing things by subnets and IP addresses. And if you want to look at the vulnerabilities, you got to click on the IP address, expand, see all the vulnerabilities. It's a nightmare. So whenever you're looking at vulnerability management, we're working with customers. It's by it's application. It's complete train wreck. It's by yeah. application is what you're saying. Actually, I think yep. the demo Matt and I just saw like an hour or two ago, groups it by application, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. Matt. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So. Groupings. It's awesome. Yeah. So. No, it's good stuff. Uh, I'm yeah, not this sure is, this who is... Vulcan Cyber is or uh, what their product's all about. If it were, I mean, it could be awesome. I, I don't, I'm You're going to sure. find out soon because they're coming. Well, and I'm just going to say, you know, Vulcan Cyber, just so you know, this is, this is a trigger issue for me. <laughs> and I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. It's not against you. It's not against you and just you. All the vulnerability management vendors out there suck. It's not, it's not, it's not you. I'm not picking on you. I'm talking about a trend in the industry. So please go do great things. Uh, let's see. Uh, zero trust data layer security platform. No. Cyril. 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 So I, I had to dig into this one a little bit because I was like, all right, who are these guys? What do they do? It looks like structured data protection because it talks about SQL, no SQL, databases, data warehouses, et cetera, right? Um, so it looks a, like a very structured data security product. Um, that's all I can tell. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I think the bigger I've challenge got... for a lot of people is unstructured data, right? It's It's... It's the um, Word, Excel, all these documents and other data that's out there that has critical data in it that's not in a structured data store of some sort. How do you handle aspects of that? So, you know, Paul and I have been looking at some interesting technologies in the unstructured data space. This looks very structured. Yeah. Yep. Um, so F5 bought Shape Security, right? Mm -hmm. That's how that all went down. Uh, and right. now, I don't know if they've got new features they're announcing here, but... Uh, in my analysis of the bot detection uh, kind of sub-industry inside of security, uh, and they did a sponsored webcast with us, but uh, like I like Google's approach, largely because to detect if something's a bot, you need some kind of AI engine, and you have to feed that AI engine with something, and Google's feeding it with data from, uh, they've got like multiple properties that 
have over a billion users or a billion visits, logins a day, mm -hmm. something like that. I mean, just think about the amount of traffic that Google can analyze and the capabilities for Google to build out a team and the uh, systems necessary to analyze that data. And basically, they're feeding it into reCAPTCHA. Um, and I know when I say reCAPTCHA, people think of the like traffic light things that drive everyone crazy. Um, but what they've done is actually built a system that you just put the code on the website. It determines if that session is a bot or not based on the awesome work from Google and having its uh, ML engine being fed from uh, other Google properties. And so for that reason, I mean, it, it really gets my vote. If you're going to look at anything, they have a free version that's limited by, you know, number of uh, amount of traffic, basically. Uh, I'm probably saying that wrong, but it is limited in some way. And then they have an enterprise version. And it's taken well, them it, years to build up to that point. Um, and well, so I don't know if you looked at it. Think about the data that's required. What's that? Uh, just think about the data that's required <laughs> to train those algorithms. Right? It's huge. And it's really cool. Now, F5 certainly uh, probably has a lot of data, right? That <laughs> they can feed into that as well. Uh, I'm not sure what, you know, some of the major differentiators are between those solutions, but. Um, it, when Google got into the mix, I was like, that. You, if you're evaluating bot detection, you have to be looking at Google as well. And again, it's re branded as reCAPTCHA, which is, you know, again, people think of the traffic lights and crosswalks. It's not that. And there's a webcast in our on-demand library that you can go check it out. Uh, yeah, I, I think this ahead, announcement, Matt. by the way, is just the integration of the shape acquisition into mm. the F5 core platform, I think is what this is. Because mm -hmm. it takes a while to integrate these companies after you buy them. We see that a lot in this industry. Well, that will round out the news for this week. Stay tuned. Some interviews coming up next.